Good evening. Uh, thank you, Tina, for the very kind uh, introduction. I'm not going to talk about any of the projects you uh, listed. Um, instead, but thanks for mentioning the book, because uh, that in a way rele also relieves me of the obligation to talk about any uh, uh, projects. The book uh, has been uh, out for a year. There we have it. Um, Unlike most books produced in the architectural world, it doesn't talk about works uh, of architecture. It essentially talks about the work of an architect, and there is a subtle uh, yet important uh, difference there. The book reflects on the state of our profession, and while there may be very, very many reasons to feel proud and, and good about our profession, there are also compelling reasons, in my view, to feel uh, worried, but more about that later. Um, the book is divided into seven uh, parts. Each part deals with a myth that, in my view, is looming over our profession. Uh, there is the myth of authority, which is pretty self-evident, I guess. Uh, the myth of individual inspiration, the myth of good causes, the myth of professionalism, the myth of independence, the myth of mastery over the last scale, and finally, the myth of uh, progress. And while in and of itself, these are, of course, very laudable uh, aspirations, there is also a flip side uh, to them. The number seven is not uh, coincidental. The Bible lists seven cardinal uh, virtues, uh, but it's also known, of course, that these seven cardinal virtues with a slight change of temperatures are intimately linked to seven cardinal sins. This is the last bit of religious uh, content. Uh, um, but anyway, in my view, and that is what the book is about, there have been certain changes uh, in the transition, let's say roughly of the 20th into the 21st century, which make an uncritical continuation of that ethos uh, problematic uh, somehow. At first glance, uh, essentially, uh, the 21st century looks like a reincarnation of the 20th uh, century, to the point that even prototypes devised uh, in the 20th century, dismissed as unrealistic, see the light of day in the 21st uh, century. Uh, the Vesnin brothers uh, here, Safdi, uh, uh, Basil Spence in, in, in Wellington, uh, Basil Spence in London, uh, Peter Eisenman in Utrecht, and uh, Gerrit Rietveld in New Haven, uh, Connecticut. Uh, this is, well, I guess everybody knows what this, what this is, Mies van der Rohe's Barcelona Pavilion with a beautiful statue and the very beautiful, lavish onyx uh, wall. This is the 21st century reincarnation by our office with a somewhat reduced marble wall for reasons I can guess, you can guess. Um, the beginning of modern architecture, very interestingly, the Maison Domino uh, by Le Corbusier, the launching pad of a whole series of new architectural freedoms intimately tied to the invention of reinforced concrete, uh, a separation between load-bearing structure and separation walls, uh, a free facade, etc., 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 essentially a drawn manifesto. That manifesto by now is ubiquitous. I mean, it's probably very difficult to find a building that doesn't have uh, that structure. Uh, but it's very, very interestingly because in a way the physical uh, omnipresence, the physical triumph of the prototype has curiously coincided with its ideological bankruptcy because this last thing is not from uh, an architecture guide or anything. This is found on a Greek website which informs people of the ample tax breaks you get from leaving a binish building unfinished. Um, we used to write manifestos. Uh, most of the 20th century architecture was uh, accompanied by some pretty radical and extreme manifestos. But let's say towards the end of the 20th century, that abruptly came uh, to a halt. And particularly some of the more radical uh, notions of modern architecture also became the subject of a, uh, a universal rejection. Essentially, since the end of the 20th century, 
we have also been demolishing very, very many realizations based on those prototypes. Large public housing estates are demolished with a frightening pace uh, all over the world. This, it started with uh, Pruitt-Igoe, 1972, uh, generally heralded as the, uh, the Waterloo of modern architecture, and ever since, uh, of course, uh, social housing estates have been demolished with a frightening uh, pace. Lyon, uh, Sheffield, Chicago, Dublin, Nantes, Paris. I can do this for over an hour. <laughs> uh, Lyon, uh, Nantes, uh, Belfast, Glasgow, Lyon again, uh, Paris, again, Glasgow again, Frankfurt, and as I understand, you are adding to the list very, very uh, shortly. So. Welcome to the world. There is something very funny about this. Let's say this is the, uh, the, the list of works about urban prototypes, how to deal with large cities, how to deal with rapid urban uh, expansions, how to deal with planning on a scale unthinkable the centuries before. And curiously enough, if you superimpose this list on urbanization in the world, you see that large parts of the rest of the world, large parts of the world outside the Western world are currently urbanizing at a pace which even outpaces uh, the, the speed that the Western world had in the 20th century. So a lot of uh, that urbanization happens in the absence of, of theory. So our discarded model is dusted off and in a curious way is the present model in, in, in large parts of the other world. This is a Chinese uh, real estate uh, office. They sell them, they build them. There's something very interesting uh, about China. China, of course, for the last 30 years has urbanized quicker than any other nation before. This is the economic uh, graph that indicates that. Something very funny about this. If you, from a rural dweller, become an urban dweller, all of a sudden you represent five times the value to the Chinese economy, which is very, very uh, interesting uh, that apparently urbanization is proof of economic success and is also an integral part of any form of Chinese propaganda. Even This is Deng Xiaoping, but that even continues today. So that to some extent, you almost see a confusion whether you are dealing with urbanance as a consequence of economic growth, or are we dealing with economic growth as a consequence of urbanism? And this is really a, re a recipe, in a way, of building uh, oneself out of uh, disaster. It's a formula very, very prevalent. It's a formula based on some of the earlier modernist uh, models practiced in China, but also exported by China uh, to other places in the world, like, for instance, uh, Africa. This is a new town uh, for a million people in uh, Angola, launched in 2008 uh, by the then president of Angola, based on a Chinese uh, master plan, but Chinese master plans look suspiciously like master plans look in general. Uh, brokered by a French uh, matchmaker uh, who had a former history in Angola based on arms uh, smuggling. Uh, this is a very interesting phenomenon. The, the, the city is built with Chinese labor, with Chinese products, with Chinese money, and the Chinese money serves as a loan, which is then backed by oil. So oil flows from Angola to China, and money flows from China to China, because the condition of the loan is that the African country spends the loan on Chinese firms. So in a way, the only thing that crosses the ocean is oil in one direction, and actually building components in the other direction. The money often doesn't even leave China. Um, so that started in about 2008. I think the deal was cleansed. A welcome in Angola. Uh, Sino-Angolan partnership at works. These are stills from a documentary uh, made by the Angolese government uh, with the president's personal involvement, as you can see here, pointing out the model and directing uh, the design of the city. Uh, a city for the young, a city 
for the old with all uh, uh, disabled conveniences uh, thinkable. Uh, something's wrong here. Um, anyway, that was 2008. Uh, a projected city on the, on the rise in value of oil. Of course, there was an oil bust pretty much later on, which led to a very daunting reality uh, in Angola. Apartments were priced anything between 120 to $200,000. The average Angolan middle class that was supposed to emerge needed to get by on $2 a day. So the outcome was somewhat predictable. Uh, in 2012, of course, the year that the price of oil really dropped, the city was built, but the city was largely empty. Essentially, Western media, BBC crews, CNN crews, reveling in delight uh, over the Chinese uh, fuck-up, uh, broadcasted the emptiness uh, of the city. Apparently, the young people, uh, the teenagers going to school, were all actors uh, in the film, and there it stood, a ghost town, not even a ghost town, because a ghost town is inhabited at one point, and then you leave. This is a town that's totally new, it's empty, but it was never uh, inhabited. It's almost like the abandonment has preceded uh, the realization of the city. So almost like uh, a model with shutters closed, pristine, white, empty roads, empty parking places, a huge uh, surreal spectacle, almost like a Corbusier city, executed uh, model to a one-to-one -one scale. Empty, empty. And there it goes. And of course, what, what happened quite predictably is that the same shanty towns that the new modern city was meant to replace started creeping up on the vicinity. The city itself is guarded by security firms to prevent people from going in and squatting. So you get the kind of the same favelas or mosaicas they're called there on the edge of the city, while the pristine modern uh, uh, city in the middle of them stands uh, empty. It's sort of symptomatic of, of the situation of the country as a whole. Oh, sorry. Um, this is Luanda, it's, its capital. It's the same thing. It's got a downtown, relatively Western, relatively modern, uh, of course, based on, on an oil boom, populated by expats. And then it's got a ring of, of, of essentially shanty towns creeping up to that modern city in the middle. So curiously, what happened in the new town is like a mini version of what's happening in the country uh, at large. Angola is one of the poorest nations on earth. And yet, its capital is the most expensive uh, city uh, in the world. And, and this is, these are points that once you're confronted with that as an, as an architect, all my understanding of, of, of economics essentially breaks down. Yet, the phenomena that we uh, see, that, that I've presented, which is prevalent in China, prevalent in Africa, isn't exclusively a phenomenon of the two continents. We did a research studio at Harvard, and we have found that phantom urbanism, as we called it, essentially uninhabited new towns, is by now a global phenomena. Ever since the crisis of 2008, the market economy has organized a wonderful mismatch between supply and demand, a, a wonderful disjuncture between any demographic need and the notion of building has occurred now worldwide. Uh, cities like Quilomba actually exist on the periphery of Madrid, uh, in this case, uh, Francisco Hernando. Uh, on the other side uh, of Madrid, the Valdeluz, completely empty new towns. They were also never inhabited. They just stand there. Here, sometimes half finished with the infrastructure fully uh, in place with the landscape design fully in place, the public realm waiting to be public, uh, I guess, and, 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 and a kind of a city where the, the, the sign, the notice board, is the biggest architectural masterpiece uh, yet uh, there. Uh, a similar development in Turin, uh, Ireland, because after the crisis you've got similar suburban uh, development, this is Kishkarigan, Dublin, here a development on the Belgian coast. Uh, and here's something else. What is interesting is that architects, 
uh, and I by no means uh, rule out ourselves in all frankness, but architects are often unwittingly involved in this mismatch, in the mismatch of supply and demand, in, the, in the, essentially the breakdown of the market economy when it comes to housing uh, provision. This is Herzog and Demerom in Lebanon, uh, a big housing tower called the Terraces, uh, and, and which I guess is a piece of modern architecture, which I guess is even a piece of, of good architecture. But it solicits very, very different responses. On the one hand, in the property press, it is hailed as a world-class icon in a vibrant city and blah, 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 blah. Uh, on the other hand, in the local uh, press, it is seen as an absolute crime against the population of Lebanon because it drives up prices, it's vacant, etc., etc. And the weird irony is, if, if you look at the setting of it, uh, this is the new building, the Herzog and Demeron. Uh, this is an older building from the late uh, 70s, the Holiday Inn. Both buildings are empty. Both buildings are about the same size. The building in the 70s was uh, completed, never used, taken over by snipers in the Lebanese uh, Civil War. It still stands there with bullet holes. There have been numerous plans made to bring it back to life, all of which failed. And adjacent stands another building, more or less of the same size, also empty. But while the emptiness of the building on the left represents a trauma, the emptiness of the building on the right represents a triumph, an economic triumph at least, because all apartments are sold, nobody lives there, but that doesn't matter because there's the absolute certainty that in a thriving property market, the apartments will be sold for more money than they were bought. So as long as the trade continues, the raison d'etre for the building is, uh, is there, and that is one of the crucial differences, I think, between the 20th and the 21st century, that the necessity which underlies building has undergone an important shift, which I think can only be properly explained if you study the, econo uh, the economics uh, behind it. This is uh, a book from 2013, Capital in the 21st Century, by Thomas Piketty, a French uh, economist, who has analyze the history of money uh, according to a very simple principle. What he has compared is the return you get from capital on labor, in other words, by working, and the return you get on capital itself. In other words, how much money do you make from working, and how much money do you make from having money? And that is, of course, a very interesting notion, because as soon as the situation arises that you make more money from what you own, from what you have, somebody who works very hard can, uh, and doesn't have as much money can never catch up. In other words, it is the perfect uh, condition for a class society to re-emerge. Hereditary wealth once again becomes the defining factor in people's uh, lives and, and essentially there's no way of, uh, of, of catching up. Um, any emancipatory principle fundamentally breaks down uh, in, in this phase. And the interesting thing is when you look at property, here, global value of real estate, uh, all real estate in the world is $280 trillion. The global GDP is a mere 80 trillion. So we are well past the point that he is describing. This is uh, essentially uh, his graph applied to the construction industry. Uh, the money made from property and the money made from the labor related to property, related to building. Curiously, the transition point where one overtakes the other coincides perfectly with the moment the architectural profession essentially uh, wrote manifestos. Um, it coincides perfectly with, with the day that I guess architecture deployed by human needs and not financial needs ceased to matter, even though modern architecture continued as a style uh, almost seamlessly. It is very interesting what happens. This is our, uh, oh. this is our uh, hometown, uh, Amsterdam. Property prices in our town are going through the roof. People offer way more uh, often for properties than they're even put on the market for. Spectacular rise of property prices. Normally, property prices rise in a condition of scarcity. 
That's very strange because, I mean, for the last 30 years, the population of the Netherlands has been more or less stable. Uh, we've got a housing stock of which less than 20% is actually old enough to be replaced. So it's not because repletion of the housing stock. It is not because of a rapid population growth. Uh, it's a very strange situation because even the older the, pro the, the, older the building, the more valuable uh, it is. What is happening by and large is that the housing stock of the Netherlands, uh, uh, the shortage and the demand, is actually not because of people looking for a home, but it's because, essentially because money uh, is looking for a home. Most of the houses are bought not to be lived in, but to be rented out to others. And about 70% of all purchases in the Netherlands were made by foreign investors, uh, essentially people who invest money because interest rates, with interest rates being at a historic low, property uh, gives you a lot more. And of course, this is by no means a unique situation. Uh, this is a situation that London faces, New York faces, Vienna uh, faces investors. It's, of course, an Australian uh, situation. It's the situation in uh, Vancouver. And even property is becoming a reason for migration, for a completely different migration than the migration everybody is uh, afraid of. This is a very interesting example. This is Hungary. Uh, I guess the most staunch anti-immigration country in Europe, uh, a country that is, I think, on the verge of getting kicked out of the EU, uh, largely because of a dispute uh, over immigration policies. And this is a country that essentially handed out EU passports to people who invested a certain amount of money in the economy. And a lot of that money is invested also in property. So therefore, a booming property market and a kind of trade in citizenships is taking a very in important flight, particularly in countries that are anti-immigration. Um, in 2014, the global rich man had estimated 2 billion on buying property, but on acquiring other nationalities. This is Oleg Deripaska, a Russian oligarch, who is these days a Cypriot. This is uh, Rami uh, Makhlouf, a Syrian businessman who passes as an Austrian uh, today. Uh, not very many people from Syria are allowed into Austria uh, at the refugee crisis, is an interesting note. Former vice president of Angola, who is Portuguese, so he joined the ex-colonizer. Uh, and Peter Thiel, whom you know, PayPal, the USA, who is a New Zealander. There are even charts on the internet which, in a way, relate the trade in property to the best countries to simply buy citizenship off. It's a very interesting, uh, perverse, and of course worrying uh, trend. Uh, it has a number of consequences, and ultimately it also has consequences for architecture. The first consequence is, of course, an escalation of housing prices. This is a um, famous uh, Chinese chef that lived in Amsterdam, most expensive apartment in Amsterdam, uh, somewhere along the river, $16.2 million. Uh, this is Nick Candy, who bought uh, an apartment in one of his own uh, properties on One Hyde Park for $60 million. He actually bought it from himself, and the whole purpose was to raise the bar for, for apartment prices or set a precedent. This is the record so far, Michael Dell, uh, in, in 157 along uh, Central Park, for over $100 million. Uh, for, for a penthouse. So that's the first consequences. It's almost like a trade in football players where you know, ever more ridiculous amounts of transfer prices are paid. That's also applying to property. The other phenomena that is very interesting is the absent tenant or the absent uh, owner. Uh, Qatari, uh, another series of purchases, a, a Qatari businessman buying a property in the Vignoli Tower in Manhattan for 60.2 million, sorry, for 87. Uh, uh, same thing, never cited there. Um, Jennifer Lopez and Alex Rodriguez supposedly purchased an apartment, although that is not true. Uh, this was a, a very, very marketed, in a way, as a publicity stunt uh, that they would live there. Supposedly, this purchase never uh, ever took place, but merely served to create hype. Of course, the, uh, the, the very slender apartment tower is a perfect typology for that type of use. 
or that type of non-use, one could say. Uh, this one is pretty thin. This one is very thin, uh, often just one apartment per floor. That means if your neighbors aren't there, you don't notice them because essentially you don't have neighbors. Uh, the shop tower, which is even uh, thinner, and I think it is uh, somehow interesting to kind of speculate on the ultimate architectural form that this evolution uh, has. So that's Fignoli, a uh, high and thin uh, shop, even higher, even thinner. There we go, they're thin, to the point that if nobody lives there anyway, uh, a building may as well be a concrete sculpture. Uh, simply a concrete sculpture that is traded on the stock market and accrues value. And if you think that is ridiculous, uh, there are things like that happening. There are buildings in the world where the function of a building is a mere alibi to the concrete structure that the building is. This is the monument of the Constitution. Uh, this is in an unnamed Central Asian dictatorship, uh, uh, which has anything but a constitution. Uh, in, in the same uh, city, uh, the house of the largest Ferris wheel. Brilliant excuse to make a building. And, and then here, this is the Palace of Happiness. Uh, um, the house of free creativity in the shape uh, of a book, but of course there is no free creativity in, in, in a kind of Stalinist former social uh, republic. Uh, it's a new capital of Turkmenistan with the largest amount of gilded domes and the largest amount of white Italian marble uh, ever applied. The city as a whole is an even more impressive uh, example of what I showed in Africa and a financial success. Uh, huge empty lanes, empty white uh, buildings. It's called infrastructure, and uh, since these trains are essentially driverless, that sort of goes back and forth without a driver, but also without passengers, to serve, to go from one station to the next, to serve one empty building uh, to the next. Very uh, interesting sort of notion. The only thing is that the last image isn't Ashgabat in Turkmenistan, it's actually Vancouver, Canada. And that is worrying, because there is a correlation uh, that makes a lot of these absurd things a lot closer to our homes than we might care to think. If you look at the list of the most livable cities today, it is very interesting that six of those cities are actually the cities with some of the largest vacancy rates in the world. In other words, cities are livable when you don't live there, which is kind of a beautiful contradiction in, 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 in terms. And cities where people don't live are invariably into placemaking. Kind of, uh, I have to say it's a word I come across in my profession increasingly often, and I nod enthusiastically at anybody that throws the word at me, and I have to admit, I have no clue what it is but I doubt anybody who uses the word does. But uh, anyway, so placemaking. Calgary, sort of seemingly innocent uh, activities in a decor perhaps of empty uh, buildings. Sydney, Vancouver, uh, Toronto, a kind of childish, somewhat juvenile activities, also in the context of shiny real estate. Nobody knows if anybody uh, lives there, and placemaking is an innate ability that we all have, indeed. Um, for me, this is kind of placemaking. This, this, is, this is public space par excellence. It's a space where you can protest. It's a space where you can be disobedient. It's a space where you can all, do all the kind of things that are far uh, from innocent, but more about the yellow vests uh, later. Um, livable cities are invariably rich cities with some of the highest average salaries uh, in the world. They are also expensive cities when it comes to property. And very often they are expensive cities more than they are rich cities in the sense that prices rise much faster than salaries. And if you look at the notion of affordable housing, this is a pretty standard uh, 
a definition that's used. That I mean, if you have to uh, lend two and a half times your annual income from the bank, that is more or less uh, regarded as an affordable uh, home. So let's apply that formula. Two and a half times the average salary times the average price of square meters in any of those cities. Then this is a list of what you can buy uh, for an affordable uh, median salary. This is the amount of square meters that you can actually afford. Uh, you can afford 15 square meters as affordable homes in the most livable cities in the world. That's 15 square meters. 15 square meters is a maximum security cell at Barwon Prison. It's the smallest new Jayco caravan. It's the size of a, par a car park space, a 90 angle car park space in Melbourne uh, and, and something else. It is interestingly smaller than what was devised as the absolute existence minimum by the communist system at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, it's the size also of a container. And of course, containers are increasingly prevalent in the construction of uh, apartments. But for me, the irony is that apparently um, the outcome of prosperity, the outcome of economic growth, the outcome of supposedly escalating stock market prices and wealth is in fact that we have traded down, that we have traded down on the original uh, modernist ideals, which in a way to find a minimum for people. And I'm sure if the trend continues, then the affordable unit for an average salary is a coffin. Um, housing affordability. So this is, uh, in the course uh, of the last uh, 70 years, a rise in the average uh, income in, in the Western world. This is, in tandem, uh, what you've been able to loan from the bank uh, based on that income. It, it's sort of... Uh, became more and more and more as a slight dip in 2008, but then it escalated uh, again, of course. But this is then what the price of property did in relation uh, to that. So that rose far harder than the bank was prepared to, to lend money. And there again is that awful line, is that awful line of, 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 of the... So what is to be done? Uh, I think it's inevitable that once a system... Uh, starts to be at the disadvantage of a critical uh, number of people that, that somehow resistance and, and uprising and protest is, is, is inevitable. And of course, the communist revolution was a material revolution. The communist revolution was against uh, uh, the ownership of, of capital. If you look what capital consists of today, you see something very, very interesting. By far the largest class of capital assets are property. More than gold, uh, more than oil reserves, uh, more than GDP. The largest economic asset class in the world is real estate, it's buildings, it's the stuff we do. It is the core of, of our profession. Let's look at the economy of that. This is the Gherkin in London, the Gherkin uh, finalized in 2004. Ever since it was finalized, it traded hands twice. First to a Brazilian, and then it was later on uh, sold uh, again. But in the course of its existence, uh, let's say a mere one and a half decade, the thing went from around 300 million to nearly a billion. Simply by changing hand, it accrued an unbelievable amount of money. So if you do the math, as total building cost, uh, and then the breakdown between land cost, development cost, financing, management. You have a construction cost that comes about 140 uh, million pounds. Now, I suppose Foster is a good negotiator. I, I suppose Foster is the kind of architect that uh, organizes a decent percentage fee of the construction cost. So let's say 5% relatively high for himself in a good market. Let's say, I don't, I'm guessing here, of course, this is all privileged and confidential information that no architect tells another, but I'm guessing. <laughs> I'm method acting. Um, seven million pounds was the fee, the complete fee for the Gherkin. So compare that to the increase in value of the building from 300 million to a billion. That is 720 million. That is 100 times the fee of the architect accrues uh, 
uh, increase in value of the product uh, of the architect. So <clears throat> that's an interesting situation. It is only after man have raised themselves above the rank of animals when their labor has been socialized that a state arises in which the surplus value of labor of the one becomes a condition of the existence for the other. Sort of applies, except that this is a quote of Karl Marx. And this is a, a difficult situation because it, apparently buildings play an enormous role in, 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 in exactly that unfair uh, mechanism. Uh, when I was a child, there were two things I wanted to be. I wanted to be a revolutionary and I wanted to be an architect. And unfortunately, in the course of my career, I've discovered that the two are incompatible. Uh, and, 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 and in a way that, that is a pity. It, 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 I think, deserves thought to think what can be changed about our profession, that it isn't just blindly complicit in a number of these things. So let's look at the ethos of architecture, about 2,000 years old. This is Vitruvius, Firmitas Utilitas Venustas, uh, so it's firmness uh, or, or durability, usefulness and beauty. That was the uh, three pillars on which architects were based. That's about 2,000 years old. It didn't really change in the course of centuries. If Alberti here uh, talks about the eternal uh, of his own designs, even Ruskin, uh, buildings are supposed to last for more than one generation. And even a contemporary icon like Frank Gehry talks about timelessness when he talks about architecture. Now, how true is that? Because the life of a building, if you look at after the Middle Ages in the 16th century, the life of a building like the Tuileries was 300 years. And in the 19th century, that was reduced to a mere 150 years. In the 20th century, beginning of the 20th century, 100 years, the middle of the 20th century, 15 years, and even some of our own buildings actually have a mere quarter of a century before they get demolished. So it is not unthinkable that in the near future, actually the date of demolition will overtake the date of creation. <laughs> in other words, that you have to think about how a building is demolished before you think how it is actually uh, uh, built. So in that sense, the 2,000-year-old ethos um, of Vitruvius has to be translated into its Latin uh, antonyms. Uh, a building has to be temporary. A building has to be flexible. In other words, a good building is a building that can be used for what it was not intended. Uh, and then buildings need a certain amount of discretion. So therefore, uh, our aspirational model might have to radically change. The Parthenon and then here, uh, essentially a petrol station turned cinema. This complies to the definition. It's used for what it was not intended. It has no loyalty to place, so therefore you can pick it up, put it somewhere else. It's very discreet, you could even take it uh, away. So a very, very good work of architecture. Um, this is, in a way, a, a change of radical change of values, and it's even a radical change of value that might lead to the reappreciation of a particular type of architecture. These are communist housing blocks in East Germany, entirely made out of standard elements, out of prefabricated concrete elements, uh, blocks that are currently being dem demolished uh, uh, at a very uh, big scale. But the interesting thing here is, since it's a building of kind of concrete elements, its demolition is the same as its construction, but just the film played backwards, which means you end up with the same spare parts that you began uh, with. Those spare parts are assembled and they are recycled and they are applied to a different kind of architecture uh, altogether. It's very interesting that the recycled, more modern project uh, of, of old communist housing estates is something that looks distinctly more, more 19th uh, century. This is the house on the cover of the, of the book. Um, if you can recycle buildings, you can essentially move buildings. Uh, I guess there has to be no limit in scale of what you move. You could move entire churches. If you're in the business of moving uh, buildings, then there is no real need that the means of transport and that what you move actually has to be a different thing. So this is a 
truck as a house. This is a ship as a house. This is a house that walks. Uh, and this is a, a 1960s uh, vision by Ron Heron of an entire city that could uh, walk. And flippant and foolish as that idea may seem, I think there is a compelling benefit to regarding uh, architecture not as an eternal but as a temporary phenomena uh, on this planet. You can't do this in English, but I'll try to explain. This is a Dutch word. It's a Dutch word for real estate. It means fast is fixed, goed is stuff. So it's stuff that doesn't move. And the antonym of that is losgoed, which is stuff that moves uh, by definition. So property, uh, immobilien, as they say in German, becomes that which moves. It is a, a very interesting proposition because it'll mess with the economy uh, of building and it'll mess with speculation. Here they are again, the yellow vests. But the yellow vests had a precursor. They had a precursor in the 60s. And a lot of the process, uh, protests in the 60s at the time were related to the question of property uh, as well. This is in Frankfurt, that apparently empty uh, properties in inner city were the source of big uh, societal unrests and, and, and protests. This is the proponent of the left at the time, Hans-Jochen Vogel, who actually wanted to pass a law where he separated the ownership of a building from the ownership of the land and regarded land as a finite commodity which, like air, ought never to be owned. You could own buildings, but you couldn't own the land uh, on it. If that is the case, the economic value cycle of buildings can actually conform to the normal economic value cycle of any other project. Uh, essentially, Foster's gherkin could be mirrored. <laughs> it's a symmetrical building. So. Um, and, I think. and the main benefit of that is that a particularly horrible class of people could actually <laughs> disappear. And there we go. Thank you very much. <laughs>